everyone. Thanks, gentlemen, for the great sessions. Uh, so Kasun spoke yesterday. If you were at uh, Kasun's session yesterday, Kasun spoke about the introduction to integration, uh, what our future plans are. And Kasun also went into detail on uh, the advanced aspects of integration. Uh, Dave and John basically gave a great introduction to Fidelity, how Fidelity is handling integration, but also at a higher level, how, how Fidelity works with end customers using API management, how the whole uh, publishing part works, the publisher, the store, and the importance of integration uh, basically moving forward. Gion spoke about the Swiss chocolate story. Uh, Gion basically also focused on, on the iterative architecture, the value of partnerships. Uh, so we had a, look, a, a peek at many of the architectural diagrams as well, basically seeing how integration plays a role uh, there. So thank you, gentlemen, for that. Um, so for today's panel, uh, you, we also want to get questions from you. So I'm sure you have questions based on the sessions we've had so far, uh, the sessions from today, and the sessions from yesterday as well. Uh, so we should have Dushan, who spoke as well in the room, uh, but Kasun can respond as well. So, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask the questions. We can send the mic around. There is also a way to ask questions using the WSO2Con app, and I'll be monitoring that, and we can basically take questions from there as well. So to just kick things, kick, uh, things off, so my first question is the role of integration in digital transformation, right? So uh, I think uh, everyone has an idea of how you're using integration today. But uh, I, would, I would like to first hear from John, uh, basically on the role of integration in digital transformation. So really it's about speed. So having the right toolkit can allow people from different companies or those within the same company to move at a pace that we've never been able to do before. And I think the repertoire of the WSO2 componentry allows for that speed, which is a great way to go. Okay. So, Gion, I think you've been following the whole digital transformation story that we've been uh, talking about as well, right? Uh, but what do you think, how, how do you think integration is important in the overall digital transformation? I mean, um, we were a few, a few years ago, we just were a solution provider for the Swiss government. And it's unbelievable that we turn now more and more to an integrator and the solution is less important than integration. And we saw that now with the platform Fiscal IT. We have several solutions, but the integration is really a key part and also a very time-consuming part. And uh, if you look at how to debug the whole system, it's important that the integration part is working and you have really good dashboards so you are fast to, um, to find the problems and solve them. And you solve it from an integrated view, not from a solution. So you don't look at the application, but you ask first the integrator or the integration platform what's the problem. And based on these information, you go further to the application. And that's quite a different approach than before. Before we had always look at the application, what's going wrong with the application, and then we went to the integration and so on. And this makes it really difficult to find fast the problems. Right, thanks. Uh, so, so Dave, uh, a different twist on that same question. So. Fidelity is a, a massive organization, right? So you have all kinds of backend systems from mainframes, legacy systems to newer greenfield projects. How do you really start on a project of this scale? What's your experience there? Well, I must say I've always had the pleasure of looking at new technology as an architect um, and vetting that technology against its maturity. However, as much as I think I live in a greenfield world, I live in a brownfield world. So it's always about evolution, not revolution. But it's also about speed to market and agility. So I see integration, and I know I'm not the only one that sees this, John, and other people in our organization see it essential to be able to coexist with things that we want to evolve and things that we start evolving immediately. So that coexisting and, and making that opaque 
to the outside world and to the consumer is, is really a function of integration. And there's many, many places in our, in our structure that that needs to happen. We mentioned uh, single sign-on with, with security and, and federation of that model. We mentioned the, I, I know I need a better orchestration engine. So as we start to build fine-grained services that may be domain-specific or may be uh, you know, purpose for, for, for lots of things across many platforms, there's the need uh, for composite services, right? And that's always dubious because uh, when you provide a co composite service and you enter an interface, uh, then you have the challenge of which data can this, people, th 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 this, this service actually provide with its consumer? And then also uh, the, another part of uh, a dubious battle is how do you make that reusable? So there's, there's many places in the, in the structure that integration plays. Um, combined with that comes, uh, you know, the need to be fast. So uh, that's always a factor. Uh, slowly. <laughs> uh, as much as I say we like to go uh, fast, uh, we are a, a rest, uh, we have a rest objective in a SOAP world. So it's evolutionary, I guess, is, is, is what I can say, but, but essential, an essential piece of our, our, our architecture. Okay, thanks. Uh, any questions from the audience so far? Any, anything you want to raise based on what we heard from these gentlemen? So um, I, I worked for Fidelity for some time, and I've seen that you know we, we document things very neatly, and there's like a um, Rebit website where people post questions and a lot of people answer. And in fact, I, I helped uh, myself a lot from that, and in fact, I, I answered a lot of questions, right? So do you plan on exposing that kind of knowledge to public? I mean, not, not just to keep within Fidelity, but just to, just to you know, share it with others? Uh, did you understand the question, John? So, what, uh, sharing part of the solution to others? I'm not sure. Uh, so, we, we had something called Rebate internally, and people used to ask questions. Uh, so, I, I, was, I was new to the digital platform that we were building in Fidelity, and I had like tons of questions, and I, po I used to post them on Rebate, and people used to answer. So that, I, I think that that has a lot of um, uh, knowledge with respect to WSO2 ESB in particular. So do you plan on sharing that with public? So is it, you know, some, make, some, make, make it more like a blog so people can gain, you know? Uh, that, yeah, I think we could probably collaborate with some folks from WSO2 to share some of the best practices, right. of which there are many already on the WSO2 site on how to do best practices like that. I think if we can contribute to that, we're happy to do right. it. Yes, so, so we, we do have a lot of case studies out there, and, and we, we use customer case studies a lot as well. But I'll, I'll let Kasun chip in here as well. Kasun, so, so how, how's our effort on basically uh, collating like multiple customer stories, putting out reference architectures and customer case studies there? Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, basically what we have uh, uh, done so far based on the lot of customer feedback on and all that. Uh, we came up with quite a lot of best practices. Uh, it can be for the ESB or API manager. So likewise, we also get the feedback from the customers on uh, how to enhance the products. So at the moment, we have most of the best practices and patterns available as part of the documentation. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we also focus on uh, None uh, on generic stuff, which is not directly related to the ESB or WSO2, things like uh, emerging patterns and how you can uh, like better scaling, scaling best, best practices. So likewise, we f focus on uh, both aspects, WSO2 and non-WSO2 aspects related to the technology that we are working. It can be integration, API management, or security. So at the moment, it uh, the Output channel is through documentation or uh, articles available in the WS2. Uh, Not to mention the videos you have on YouTube from past conferences. That yes, can... yes. I'm not on the payroll for WS2. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks, John. We'll we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. So, uh, did that answer your question at a high level? Yeah, uh, as uh, I did, and I have like one more question. Um, so we used to use something called DP transformer that was, I think, custom written by some engineer in Fidelity, and that was like super fast uh, with respect to XSLTs and I mean uh, JSON transformations or XSLTs, right? It was like super super fast. I still remember that code. So, uh, do you do you plan on sharing that and you know uh, kind of incorporating that within WSO2 as OSGI or uh, as a jar? 
Uh, so shall I take that first? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. So, yeah. So so basically, so as as W said, so there's multiple fidelity divisions, and and as we are working as a very close partner with fidelity. So so it's a it's a two-way thing. So we help by sending consultants, giving architectural uh, assistance, so on and so forth. But then finally, it's all fidelity-owned code and, and fidelity proper, property, really. Right. So, so there there are situations where uh, we we basically take some of the best practices, the recommendations, and build products. Like for example, uh, Ballerina it was an effort uh, that has been coming for some time. Right. So. But we, we got the requirements for the concept of micro-integration from organizations like Fidelity and many other organizations. So it is a two-way thing. And, and we, do, we do take a lot, of, a lot of things back and, and then basically build new products or incorporate new features. Uh, do you want to add to that, uh, Dave or John? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of the internals of, of what we have and use in DP Core are, are you know, prevalent throughout the development community. It makes their life easier. I'm not, I know that Transformer is probably more expath and, and, and you know, class mediators uh, that, that probably needed to uh, have a, a good acceleration rate on how fast it is. Um, while I like that, um, it's not always uh, flexible enough to migrate. So the more stuff you put in Java, the more trouble you get into, right? I'd, I'd much rather see that in, in, in a construct that, that, that has been expressed by, with Ballerina or, or actually XSLT, which, is, which will keep you above the interface into the engine. But, um, you know, I, I, I can't say I can share that. <laughs> I can certainly say that I belong to the community, but, uh, you know, uh, we'll work with WSO2 to, 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 to do as much as we can to, to do that. And, and the way I like to do it is in the form of patterns anyway. I mean, patterns are really uh, the shareable thing, right, and the reusable thing. So um, we need to call the patterns out and, and find out which ones are the best ones. And I'm very interested in contributing to the, the ballerina effort. So, so that's, that's really where I'd like to see us go, John. Thank you. So uh, uh, based on Dave's presentation and, and John's presentation, so you, you spoke a lot about SOAP, right? So you, you spoke about uh, clients using SOAP, uh, your backend services using SOAP. So I'll, I'll pass this on to Kasun. So where do, you, where do you see the future? So you've been working with multiple W sort of integration customers, right? Uh, who was like really heavily into SOAP in the past and now moving towards REST. Uh, but we, we see that, uh, that there are lots of legacy clients who can still consume SOAP. Right? So where do you see that future going? Yeah, so, uh, so let me start with the design for Ballerina itself. So if you look at the Ballerina constructs, we mostly inherited those constructs from REST uh, architectural principles. Uh, and, and all the new APIs available are uh, more or less based on REST and JSON-based uh, message types. Uh, but still, I would say uh, the SOAP integration is still uh, frequently used because you will have systems that use a SOAP and, and also even with microservices architecture, uh, using SOAP can, might make sense at some point because compared to JSON and REST, uh, SOAP offers much more uh, powerful features like validation, validation uh, schema validation, likewise security. Uh, security. Uh, yeah, so likewise quite a lot of, uh, you can like pick and choose what is the best solution, but when it comes to API design, uh, what I'm seeing is uh, more and more people tends to use uh, REST and JSON concept. And also the security, WS security itself is way too complex when it comes to the consumption of the API. So that's why protocols like OAuth is getting so popular. So I would say the SOAP, the validation part will be still used in the future, but uh, WS security is more or less uh, getting uh, 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 expired now. Dave, yes. I, can, I must say. Do you disagree? As an, <laughs> no, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and I tend to, you know, as architects, put our foot down and say, rest only. And believe me, I got redirected. <laughs> we have soap consumers out there that continue to be soap consumers. Is a good reason why they're going to be soap consumers, so we'll support both. Right. Um, so that, that's, that's the way we're going to go in our store. So, Gian, uh, again, same, same question. Uh, how easy is it? to basically push an API-based model or fully RESTful services model to 
your clients or your consumers, or do they still expect like you have that you have legacy SOAP interfaces exposed as well? So um, we use basically uh, still uh, SOAP, and the reason is because of the security. We have Swiss government is a very beautiful uh, target um, to get in, and so um, we are more with uh, SOAP. But REST is also used. We have for the, um, uh, <clears throat> the front end, which is not where security is not so important, we use REST. And, um, but for um, machine communication, we use just SOAP. For example, we have now the information exchange for the banks, and this relies only on SOAP, not REST at all. So let me switch tracks a bit. Uh, so we've been talking about uh, the integration track for a few days now. This is the second day. Uh, we've been also we've also introduced you to micro integration and ballerina, right? So, uh, so I, I want to start with John. So today you have a centrally governed ESB, right? And and uh, now we are talking about this whole distributed set of uh, distributed governance. Uh, microservices was a concept that came up. As, as well, and there's this whole microservice movement there, and now we are talking about micro integration. Uh, do you see like organizations like Fidelity immediately moving to something like micro integration, from moving away from a centrally governed model to a distributed governance model? So you know, like Dave said, it'll be evolutionary. Whatever we do, the key thing is. Uh, what Sanjeeva mentioned the other day is governance through surveillance. And I think that's kind of a gap today, but with the power of many of the toolkits, in, um, including Ballerina and others, we can begin to have that feedback loop because today the governance registry is more of just a design time tool and doesn't have that feedback loop of governance by surveillance. And I think that's going to put teeth in the whole governance game, which I think will really uh, improve the operation quite a bit. So um, I think that'll happen, but at the same time, that'll allow experimentation to happen in other frameworks and patterns as that goes, but that will still never displace the need for core oversight and governance and approval to make sure that uh, you don't have three teams trying to solve the same business domain problem. And that kind of governance is really, um, is very heavily augmented by surveillance, which is nice. Uh, trust but verify. Right. So uh, I'll, I'll come back to you, Dave. But, uh, so I want to start with Kasun here again. So. Uh, why micro-integration? So you've been working in this field for more than 10 years, right? So you, you've seen it all. And uh, you were one of the uh, lead architects behind this whole movement towards micro-integration. Why? Yeah, so, so uh, one thing that we have uh, seen, especially during last year or so, is uh, if, you are, if you go and say you are, that you are using ESB in your next project, then uh, nobody will like that. Right? So that kind of mentality uh, is there because of the microservices movement. But if we properly analyze what it really meant uh, from microservices and integration, uh, this is actually coming from this uh, smart endpoint and dumb pipe uh, thing of uh, Martin Fowler's theory. Uh, what his recommendation is to move this centralized integration logic to the endpoints and the service. So basically, your endpoints becoming smart and as well as the service. So, but when you look at how, these, how the microservices architecture is implemented in practice, I'll take two examples. One is uh, Netflix and the other one is Uber. So if you look at both of these microservices implementation, they have, in the Net Netflix case, they have the orchestration logic residing in their API gateway, like the composition. And uh, in the Uber's case, they have set of microservices and set of edge services, uh, which is doing the orchestration. So this is not necessarily a smart endpoint and dump pipes. What it really important uh, in the aspect of microservices and container is that ability to scale and independently develop your integration scenarios. And you are not deploying all your integration scenarios into a central uh, integration middleware, rather you develop, deploy, manage all your integration as independent entities. So those are the things that we call uh, micro-integrations or micro-integration 
my integration microservices. So what we enabled uh, through uh, through the use of Ballerina is it's sort of a micro integration framework that you can leverage to build integrations. And one last aspect of the uh, integration uh, micro integration is that. Uh, often, as brownfield enterprises, we have to deal with quite a lot of legacy systems, uh, SOAP services, and all that. So if you are going to build all this integration through, let's say, Java code, so that is not going to work. Like It is not practical, and you cannot really build uh, agile solutions uh, with that approach. So that's why we focus on building Ballerina, which has a micro-integration framework. Thanks, Kasur. So let me take a pause there. And again, uh, any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, we have the mic. You. Hello. The mic there. Hi. I have oh, a question. There's a question there. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so I have a question on um, the subscription aspect of um, APIs, API Manager. Now, by subscription, um, you know. Um, uh, or the subscription process usually involves approvals, right, along a chain of command. Um, and, and by that, we are essentially talking about some sort of a business process server or, or, or model, right, where, you know, you, in, you are sort of integrating your um, API manager subscription with some BPM server or service uh, that's, you know, you know, doing this approval. Uh, of your APIs, um, so just wanted to know if there is there are any known patterns regarding that out of there, or you know if anybody has done that. Uh, right. So, uh, Dave, do you want to talk about what you do in Fidelity as well in terms of workflows for subscriptions? Well, um, like I say, in, in institutional, we're a little bit new to that because we actually you know we haven't implemented a ton, but in our personal investment place, we, they've actually implemented IBM BPM to do the subscription handling. So what that was is actually a request from a website to you know, subscribe. And then basically that request was handled by a workflow that would pick it up in conjunction with the request and then give the request to WSO2. And at which point somebody would actually subscribe for you, get a credential, and then get you onboarded. So it was kind of like manual request handling with the subscription process, but actually a, a fully fledged uh, PI anointed person to actually implement that subscription and get the credential uh, kicked off and, and subscribed to. I don't know, John, do you, you, you've been thinking? I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that um, very often there are lawyers involved in contracts to be signed, which is an out of band management experience separate from the technology person pressing a button to say, yes, I've gotten the thumbs up and now I you know, approve your subscription. So there's a lot of out of band stuff. Which is absolutely about workflow. <laughs> Yes. And absolutely essential for workflow. So wait for subscription, get, get, wait for signature, get signature, get approvals. I mean, I spent half my life doing workflow, and that's absolutely that, that kind of pattern. So that's in and around the adjacent pieces that you need for WSO2, right? Right, yes. So yeah, just, just to add to that answer there. So, so from an API management perspective, we provide hooks where you can plug in a workflow engine. So BPMN or BPEL. So, uh, at, at the API storefront, when you create an application or when you try to subscribe to an API or when you, uh, when you basically uh, want to invoke the API, so on and so forth. So there are various hooks, and you can plug in your workflow engines. Uh, so again, yes, technology is just one part of that, right? So within the workflow engine itself, if it supports human tasks, you can actually wait for human input and, and then uh, do it in an asynchronous manner, send a notification outside, for example. But then, yes, that technology is just part, uh, one part of that whole process, right? And then you could even automate the creation of the APIs, right? You call the REST, uh, the REST service and create the API, generate keys, and subscribe. That's right. So that can all be part of an orchestrated workflow yeah. with, uh, with intermediate uh, patterns that go into WSO2. Yes, that's right. Uh, so we had another question here. Uh, do you have the mic with you? Uh, yeah, I didn't do this. Hi, uh, my name is Vishwajit. Uh, this question is uh, more related to uh, the enterprise service bus. Uh, uh, we know that uh, the enterprise service bus is more related to the API uh, processing and validation. Uh, uh, from uh, our company, we are trying to utilize the same for file processing uh, in terms of an extract transform load. 
So uh, with your experience, uh, what do you recommend to go in terms of uh, uh, using the uh, enterprise service bus as an uh, ETL uh, workflow engine and, and, and uh, performing, uh, 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 reading a file, processing a file, and, and then and, and transforming it and sending it across? Would you recommend that will be the question? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, so this is uh, what you're asking is a file gateway kind of a scenario, so which, right. is, uh, which is common uh, usage of WS2 ESB. Uh -huh. uh, so there are customers who are using WS2 ESB as the file, uh, like file routing or file gateway, which means uh, you configure an inbound file path, like an inbound endpoint or a file uh, VFS proxy service, mm -hmm. where you can listen to a particular FTP or file location. And when there are new files available, it will inject the file content into the mediation flow. So in the mediation flow, you can uh, do all kind of uh, message routing and again send that through uh, the file, the sender part, like the sender uh, endpoint, through to another file system. So there are two aspects. You can either do content-based file routing by processing the content of the file, as well as uh, I would say the common scenario is file streaming, uh, mostly based on the file metadata. You stream file through the gateway. Uh, so in that case, we are not building the file content and loading that into the memory, ESB runtime. Rather, we, uh, we bypass the file content as a stream from the listener to the sender. So it's a common use, use case. Okay. Uh, and also with Ballerina, uh, we already have this file uh, server and client connector. So we are planning, and also there are specific file integration needs, like uh, it is not just reading files and sending. There are quite a lot of file gateway related scenarios that we are planning to cover uh, in the future. Okay, okay. Thanks, Kasman. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes, uh, should we go there and Harindu? Um, okay, yeah, the, the mic behind, sorry, <laughs> thanks. I have a, um, a less kind of technical question, more of a staffing for you guys. So like, as you're picking up all these WSO2 pieces, how, how do you find the, the people to do them? Are you training inside of your companies and just selecting them that way? Or what, what do you look for when you're trying to find people to do it? Uh, John, yeah, do you want to go at that? Uh, I mean, you mean how to uh, find service provider or at uh, WSO2? No, like actual employees. So like my, my team is uh, very small. We're growing, we're picking up pieces. We only have the ESB right now. But finding even people to work on the ESB or to pick up the new pieces has proven extremely challenging. So just like, how, how you guys have gone about that. Um, yes, we have uh, really two good uh, service providers. And then uh, we learned that by um, on the job. Because it's really difficult to find people, WSO2 cracks. Um, you don't find them on the street. So the only thing is to take more or less people who are keen on uh, learning something new. And then you let them work together with, uh, with um, a service provider. And there are also very good um, courses which you can, uh, um, can uh, uh, use, you know, and uh, I think this is the way we are doing that. But this takes uh, uh, time, so that means uh, it takes uh, around half a year or nine months before somebody's really uh, into this WSO2 uh, um, material. Um, John, do you want to? Respond as well. I would just echo that all of the above. Um, I, I think it's important to really kickstart the immersion. Uh, you need to bring in some folks who have been through the exercise before, because if you just start at the beginning of the manual and try to figure things out, it's going to take a while. So you need to work on multiple fronts of bringing in expertise where you can while you train your folks up and get the hands-on experience. It's got to be all of the above. Right. Uh, thanks. Cindy, was that an acceptable answer? <laughs> yes. Right. Um, the mic, sorry. Uh, so Mike will do that and then come here. Uh, do you have Mike? I don't know. Yes, sorry. 
Um, actually, I wanted, wanted to go back to the storefront a little bit and the API storefront. Um, there's been a lot of buzz about Swagger and the use of Swagger as a contract, and it certainly facilitates the technical integration when I get two developers talking how to use the stuff. Is what I think is missing that I'd like your opinion on is the, the semantic correctness of using particular services for business purpose. In my case, I work in the healthcare industry and we have lots of services, from everything from patients to providers to locations. And some of that data is better than other. <laughs> And we struggle with having the right level of documentation to say, you can use this patient information for these purposes that make sense, where you should not use this you know, service for these other use cases. Have you dealt with any of that, in the, especially in the financial? Yes, <clears throat> we encounter also the problem with the swagger, and we solved it in another way. We automated you know, the configuration based for example, in our case, on uh, an Excel file. So you have everything in the Excel, and so you have really a good overview. You can search, you can do everything with this, and that's for us the, the most important um, to document it, you know. And uh, afterwards, we just feed in this Excel file in UCD, and UCD will do the rest. And that's what I already, um, just mentioned that this is not always very simple because sometimes these are rest in rest um, a construct which you have to establish uh, on a programmatic way to configure, for example, in the API managers, the um, APIs. So we um, use this approach um, because Swagger is not supported completely, and that's why we seek for another uh, solution. Um, that's an interesting question. I think it's really up to how you design your service. So today, your services are, are they SOAP-based, WSDL-based? Okay, so, so that means that you must pay special attention to the resource, right? Because the resource is actually going to control. I think in healthcare and financial services, who can see what data is absolutely important. So you've got masking, you've got other sensitivities that go along. And I think if you do a good job with your resource and qualification of the resource and then who can access that from the outside world, I think, I think you can, you'd be better off. I, I've seen... Lots of good points about namespaces and WSDLs and operations that are alike, um, and not always easy to document. <laughs> but uh, I think you get a lot of that automatically by dealing with resources with Swagger. I mean, is it is it full there? Does it need extensions? Absolutely, but it's a lot more flexible. Um, so, uh, what, what concerns you about it? What, when you say semantics, what semantical issues are you thinking about? The scenario that plays out all the time is that a new service comes. We have, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, we end up having meetings around what data, where did it come from, how old is it, what are the, quali you know, what are the quality metrics on the data, is it timely enough for real-time service or is it 24 hours old and that I can do certain things with that data but I can't do other things with it. So we end up with these usage discussions with every one of the consumers that wants to use some of our new services. and. I would want to get that documented up front in a consistent manner so we could add those quality metrics and indicators into the actual documentations of the APIs. I just don't see that. I would say the regulators itself. would agree with you. Data lineage is a very big thing from yeah. a regulatory perspective. Yeah, Where did the data come from and what happened to it? Uh, that's absolutely foundational. I think the other part of what the API manager gives you, though, is the ability to do other non-technical documentation about what use case is it appropriate to use that API or not, and to the, you know, the whole taxonomy, what is each element or resource, in your case, meaning. And I think those are the value adds that you can do outside of the technical documentation. Right. Thank you. Uh, so um, uh, Mike has a question, right? Sure. Thanks. Uh, this one is for David. Uh, something you mentioned in your talk uh, gave me pause for thought. An architect called Mike Jekyll once described writing Zacamole policy documents as a horrific experience. Um, what has been your experience of, of, of Zacamole and how committed are you to that approach? To be honest, I was, a I was fra afraid. <laughs> My security architect who's sitting right behind you. Um, <laughs> 
saw that as a way to alleviate some of the problems that we have implemented in a, in a database. So, so basically we have, okay, here's a service. The service can call 20 stored procedures. How do I vet that? How do I create white lists, black lists around that? And, and to be honest with you, she saw policy sets as an extremely good way to do that. And the first implementation, and we're, we're just dabbling with it, you know. We're, we're, we're a little worried about uh, that being performant, but from what I can see and how we could probably cache that, I think it's going to work fairly well. Can you abuse that? Sure. <laughs> but I don't claim to be a Zocmol expert. I do like the notion of affixing Zocmol policies to the service and applying that in the government's reg governance registry as a policy implementation point. That, that's all attractive to me as an architect. The implementation of it is, uh, you know, it, it, we're doing slow and steady kinds of rolled outs. But uh, it, it, it's going into production um, this year, and, and from what we can see, it's not that bad for, for some of the performance aspects. But you're talking about the authoring aspects of it, yeah. right? Is, is yeah. it done? WSO2's stuff can use a little work. I mean, I think Sue can speak to that. Um, it was a little clumsy. But, um, I, you know, we're, we're just starting to dabble with it. I mean, you might want to ask that lady right behind you her thoughts. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll, is there anything on the IS6 that addresses that? I don't know. In, and, yeah, so I, I think uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let the identity server guys talk on that. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to know, did, do, you, uh, do you enforce data level entitlements at the service level as well, obviously? Do we... The, okay, so, so fundamentally we built a framework where Zocmo policies are actually used to vet the capabilities of the service. Yeah. Then the application server actually caches all that data and then the service itself uh, will have, the service, the service itself calling sort of procedure has to use that mask, if you will. Got it. As it's controlling mask. Got it, yeah. So, so that's, that's where it is. It's, I mean, it comes out of ID server, basically gets fluffed up and instantiated in the, in the, in the service touch point as, as a controlling mechanism. All right. That's, that's our thinking. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, I'll, let me stop the questions there. Uh, so I think uh, Dave and John would be around as well, and Gion as well, uh, and Kasun. So any questions, you can definitely, I think, uh, ask them. Uh, so, so thank you, gentlemen, for the very informative panel. Thank you, uh, everyone in the audience as well, for participating. Uh, it's, it's lunchtime now, and of course, you have the chocolates. I'm not sure where the chocolates are still there. I didn't grab mine. So, <laughs> so let's grab our chocolates and go for lunch, and I think we'll meet after lunch. And, and thank you very much again. Thank you.